Presentation concerns ankylosing spondylitis, a disease of the spine understood by the term spondylitis and resulting in ankylosis of the involved segments. We're going to look at the pathology, pattern of involvement, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, first visit, investigations and review visit. I'm going to do these all hoping that understanding the pathology leads to an understanding of all the other features. The basic pathological process that occurs in ankylosing spondylitis is an enthesitis. Now the enthesis is junctional tissue that occurs between tendon and bone, ligament and bone, capsid and bone, at costochondral junctions and at disc junctions. Involvement of the enthesis results in healing and healing is often accompanied by calcification, which can be evident on plain x-rays. It also results in ankylosis or loss of movement of the involved spinal segments. The axial skeleton is considered to be the spinal sacroiliac joints, but it can include sternofollicular and acromiculicular joints. And for the purposes of this disease, it's going to include the hips and shoulders. Is usually an ascending involvement starting at the lumbosacral area and then involved in the thoracic or cervical area but this doesn't occur in all cases and in some cases versus the case and cervical spine involvement uh, occurs first sometimes lumbosacral involvement is not symptomatic and the patient comes with symptomatic thoracic spine involvement and there's evidence of preceding asymptomatic lumbosacral disease so in the lumbosacral involvement, one gets involved with the sacroiliac joints, which is usually the area of first involvement. Then there's lumbar spine involvement, the thoracic spine involvement. There are three elements uh, to this. There's the costochondral junctions, anteriorly, the costotransverse joints, posteriorly, and the spinal uh, elements. So costochondral and costotransverse involvement may give chest pain that is different from spinal pain. Extra spinal involvement includes articular disease and extra articular disease. And the extra spinal involvement, art articular disease, is usually an asymmetric lower limb involvement. Extra spinal, extra articular disease includes the entheses at the, in the lower limb and dactylitis, which is often a collection of entheseal lesions in a digit. Extra skeletal disease is usually confined to ocular and disease of the aortic ring. And the ocular involvement is a uveitis, an anterior uveitis, uh, usually presenting as a painful red eye, and this can precede the onset of skeletal disease. Aortic ring, ring involvement results in aortic regurgitation and is a late feature in the uh, in the patients with ankylosing spondylitis. With a knowledge of that pattern of involvement, we look now at the symptoms and signs that can occur, and involvement of the sacroiliac and lumbar area. Sacroiliac uh, involvement causes pain in the buttock and posterior thigh. It can be bilateral or it can alternate from one side to the other. And this is helpful in differentiating it from root pain, which is usually unilateral and fixed on one side. The, sim the signs that occur sacroiliitis include tenderness on direct pressure and pain on compression or distraction of the sacroiliac joint. Inflammatory back pain is a key feature in spinal involvement. So it's usually in patients under the age of 40, it's of insidious onset, it improves with exercise, there's no improvement with rest, and this is in contrast to mechanical pain. And the pain is often worse at night and wakes the patient early in the morning time. Symptom of uh, involvement of the lumbar spine. The signs of this involvement can include restricted range of movement with a positive Schorber test, and this is usually after some period of inflammation, a flattened lumbar lordosis, and tenderness in the midline. Then in the thoracic area, you can have patients with anterior chest wall pain. This is usually associated with tenderness of the costochondral junctions or the nubiosternal junction. Posterior chest wall pain, and this is a feature that can be present when the patient has costal transverse joint involvement with localized tenderness and then there can be midline pain and tenderness uh, 
which has inflammatory characteristics as in lumbar spine involvement. And this signifies involvement of the dorsal spine. Now involvement of the chest wall and dorsal spine will lead to restricted chest expansion after a period. Let's look then at extraspinal disease. The articular lower limb asymmetric involvement is quite characteristic, but it doesn't differentiate from other, other types of synovitis in the lower limb other than by pattern and by its association. Entizitis, on the other hand, is fairly characteristic of this uh, condition. It's usually this, the usual symptom of pain and movement and localized the entities that are involved are usually around the heel, but there are other entities that one should be aware of in the lower limb. There's the quadricep tendon at the superior and inferior pole of the patella, the uh, insertion of the patellar tendon in the tibial tuberosity. Then there's the heel pain, and it's important that one defines whether the patient's heel pain is plantar or posterior. Then a swollen digit, as either a finger or a toe, is very characteristic of this disease and of psoriatic arthritis, and it's understood that it, it probably is a collection of entheseal lesions along a digit. For the diagnosis, therefore, we need evidence of axial disease, so inflammation of the axial skeleton, inflammatory pain or sacroiliitis, evidence of past inflammation of the axial skeleton, and that's usually evidence of loss of movement. Extraaxial disease with asymmetric arthritis, the presence or history of enthesitis, and the presence or history of dactylitis. Evidence of extraskeletal disease, uveitis, that usually is uh, uh, evident on history. Associated features are these diseases, psoriasis, reactive arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease, are often associated with a spondylitis that is clinically fairly indistinguishable from ankylosing spondylitis. The treatment, non steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, agents are the mainstay of drug treatment. They give good symptomatic relief in most cases. Disease modifying drugs such as salicypyrene or methotrexate and the small molecules one uses in other types of arthritis can be useful for the peripheral arthritis but are not useful in the axial disease. For the axial disease, anti-TNF agents are by far and away the most useful uh, in terms of symptoms, modifying outlook and maintaining mobility, maintaining posture and maintaining the patient's function. Physiotherapy is used to maintain and restore spinal movement and to maintain posture so that in patients in whom there is an inevitable loss of spinal movement, they will lose movement with a good posture so they have good function. Now, what about the first visit? Well, seeing a patient for the first time, it is important to take a history. Looking at the characteristics of the spinal pain, thinking about inflammatory spinal pain, asking about previous episodes of antizitis, previous uveitis, associated features such as psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, and recent infections such as diarrhea, urethritis. Examination involves looking at the spinal motion with a shore index, chest expansion, and the occipital wall distance, looking for baseline spinal movement, baseline chest expansion, and baseline posture measurement. Assessing extra spinal disease such as arthritis, antizitis, and associated features is usually a function of good, careful history taking. Then what investigations? Well, the ESR and CRP are very useful indicators of underlying inflammation. The presence of HLA B27 antigen can be looked for, but bear in mind this antigen is present in over 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis. 
but it's only one in four patients with HLA B27 have ankylosis spondylitis. So one needs to have this positive test in association with clinical features. And often the clinical features are sufficient that one doesn't need to do the test. Imaging, the traditional imaging uh, in the diagnosis of ankylosis spondylitis is X-ray, particularly X-ray of the sacroiliac joints and dedicated views of the sacroiliac joints will often show up sacroiliitis. But one needs a sufficient amount of disease in order to show X-ray changes. So MRI is a more sensitive way of defining sacroiliitis and identifying patients with sacroiliitis. So in the correct clinical context, usually with normal sacroiliac plain film x-rays and a strong history suggestive of sacroiliitis, then an MRI scan is very useful. It is important when asking for an MRI scan that you tell the scanning department what exactly you're looking for. So they look for evidence of inflammation with the correct sequences. Ultrasound is increasingly being used to assess the presence and degree of enthesitis. So what on a review visit? Well, one needs to look at the progression of the disease or hopefully the lack of progression due to therapy. And therefore one repeats the, ex the examinations that define spinal mobility and spinal posture the Schrober index, the chest expansion, and the occiput to wall distance. One looks for evidence of enthesitis, of active arthritis, and then of extra spinal disease, usually in the eye, and then associated features in patients in whom it is relevant. Now here is a Bath ankylosing spondylitis disease activity index, and it tells us a lot about the assessment of ankylosing spondylitis. It's a standard instrument to uh, assess the progression of these patients. So if you look at question number one, how would you describe the overall level of fatigue and tiredness you've experienced? It's asking about the overall level of inflammatory activity. Then to question two is looking for symptoms related to the spine. Question three is relating to symptoms related to the peripheral joints. Question four relates to the entheses. Question five relates to that feature of the patients waking in discomfort after a night's sleep. And question six is looking at the duration of morning stiffness, which is a crude indicator of the degree of underlying inflammation. And of course, if any of these are on the very severe side, they indicate active disease and a need for treatment. So there is a quick run through ankylosis spondylitis, hoping that you, in understanding the pathology, understanding the distribution or pattern of the disease, you will be able to understand how patients might present and how these patients need to be monitored and measured over the course of the disease.